刻むでハモンのビート Welcome back to another installment of JoJo Fun Facts, where I go over any and all obscure or interesting JoJo trivia. It's been a while since the last one of these, so I've had a lot of time to put together another interesting list. I'm really excited to talk about some of this stuff, so let's get right to it. The first is something that's just so surreal that I find it really funny. Starting in October of 2023, an official crossover was released between the Stone Ocean anime and KFC in China. This gives us these Stone Ocean themed chicken buckets, which just look hilarious. The bucket comes with a set of gold commemorative cards or magnets with chippy Stone Ocean characters on them. To promote the crossover, a photo shoot was held with the Ukrainian model Karina Koser. She's a cosplayer known for her androgynous style and is also a fan of JoJo. In my last Fun Facts video, I showed off Washi Yawashi, a cosplayer known for dressing up as extremely obscure JoJo characters. I think it's pretty interesting just how many different things he's dressed up as, and just how obscure some of them are, down to nameless or even entirely faceless background characters. However, this comment seemed to not appreciate this segment of the video, and for some reason also thinks this very clearly Japanese cosplayer is white. So despite this one loser, I'll be showing off more of these cosplays that I hadn't already. We have this chef that appears briefly in Part 5. A prison guard from the first chapter of Stone Ocean. All three of these people in the background when Kira smashes the table. The fake Jotaro. The Morio Milkman. This guy who Rohan took a picture of while looking for Kira. Father Styx from the end of Phantom Blood. The announcer for Jonathan and Dio's boxing match. The Diver who found Dio's coffin. Emporio when he was peeing blood. The rich beggar from Egypt who was killed by Pet Shop. Jonathan playing football. The sushi delivery man that was called by Cheap Trick in the manga. The guy who hit Josuke at the beginning of Part 4. One of the sailors from the Strength Arc. Dio reading a book from the first chapter of Part 1. Kira practicing Kawajiri's handwriting. And finally, his most recent cosplay from Halloween of 2023, a man washing a window from the Made in Heaven arc. These cosplays are actually part of a larger Japanese trend called mundane Halloween. This involves people dressing up as things that wouldn't normally be considered Halloween costumes, usually of super specific things that you might see in daily life. There's a good video by the channel Japanalysis on this subject, which I recommend checking out. He also shows off some of Washi Iwashi's work there. Next is a bit of JoJo trivia I bet you didn't know about. Most people probably remember the end of Part 2, which tells us what ended up happening to all the characters. For Lisa Lisa, it tells us that she moved to America and became remarried to a Hollywood screenwriter. We never actually see this guy or even know his name in the original manga. However, we actually do learn more about him in the Lisa Lisa-centered story LLF. This is a light novel that released in parts across the three issues of the JoJo magazine which tells the story of Lisa Lisa encountering stand users in South America in the 1970s. It was originally titled Ray Infinito, but was renamed for its full release in April of 2024. It gives us a lot of narration from her perspective, and in this case actually tells us about her second husband. Lisa Lisa thinks to herself about how her name has changed over the years. First, it tells us that her name was actually Elizabeth Strazo. Part 2 told us that she was actually raised by Strazo after being saved from the boat, but this story also shows us that she took his name as well. This also seems to imply that Strazo is his last name, which is kind of interesting. Then of course she became Elizabeth Joestar after marrying George II. Finally, we learn the last name of her second husband, with her name becoming Elizabeth Greenberg. It says the two of them were both over 50 when they got married. Greenberg eventually got cancer and Lisa Lisa cared for him until his death. 20 years later, Lisa Lisa is showing signs of aging and looks back on her past. While people in the Speedwagon Foundation still call her Elizabeth Joestar, this feels odd to her since she actually had the Greenberg name longer. So she says that she prefers to be called Lisa Lisa since that's been her name for most of her 100 year journey. I'd actually like to cover a bit more from this novel since the story is finally finished releasing, but I'll hold off here to avoid spoiling it. In these fun facts videos, I often like to go over the Japanese in-person events for the JoJo series. One of the biggest of these was JoJo World. This was an event celebrating the JoJo anime with various attractions and minigames. The first JoJo World debuted in March of 2021 and ran on and off until May of 2022. 
It features merchandise for all six parts of the JoJo anime, and there's actually a lot of little attractions inside that I find really interesting. The most iconic one would probably be this chair photo op which lets you take pictures with the main protagonists, which is used in most of the attraction's branding. There's also a series of mini-games where you can win some small pieces of merch. First is the Mimeta Haman Roulette. This is based on the scene of Zeppeli punching the frog to first demonstrate Haman. Here you punch a plush frog and are given a grade from A to C, which determines what prize you get. These include JoJo-themed cloths, acrylic stands, or little postcards. This is how most of the games are set up. You pay a small price, like 500 yen to play, and the grade you get is seemingly random. In case you're wondering what Mameta is, it's actually the sound the frog makes when it's punched in the manga. Next is the Ancient Roman Chariot Deathmatch Lottery Wheel. This is based on the skeleton heel stone, the arena where Joseph and Wamu fought in Part 2. You turn a crank and it spits out a ball into the arena with your grade. Then there's Dio's You're Watching Me Aren't You game. Here you just hold up your hands to the TV like you're using Hermit Purple and get a grade. Then we have the Joestar Group World Tour. This one is a bit different. For 880 yen, you sit in a private booth with a screen. You spin a wheel and then move along the Joestar Group's journey from Part 3. Each of the stops corresponds to a fight from the part, and you have to complete a minigame or quiz to proceed. The ending changes depending on how well you do. The prize for this is actually really cool. It's a full sheet of the 22 tarot cards from the part, which you can pop out as individual cards. For reaching the end and beating Dio, you also get the photograph of the group that was taken in Egypt. Next we have Let's Go to the Manga Artist House. This one costs 1100 yen, and involves you sitting down for an interview with Rohan. He appears on a monitor to ask you questions, and you essentially answer a personality quiz. At the end, Rohan judges what kind of character you would be in a manga. For playing, participants get a pink dark boy notebook. After that is the Pashone Team Assignment Suitability Diagnostic Test. This is also a personality quiz that determines whether you belong to Team Bucciarati or La Squadra, and which member your personality is closest to. Depending on which team you're selected for, you receive a phone call from Bucciarati or Risotto to give you your result. Finally, for our Part 6 attraction is the Stone Free String Lottery. Here's some ropes that look like Stone Free String are hanging from the ceiling, and which one you pull determines your prize. In August of 2022, a new version of the event was released titled Jojo World 2. This had a brand new set of minigames available. First is Blood Ritual, those chosen by the Stone Mask. Here you just put your hand up to a mask on the wall, which determines if you're a vampire or not, giving you one of three prizes. Then there's Oh My God Kisses Sticker Game. You reach into a shoe and pull out a sticker, and depending on what it says, you get your grade. Then the Erratic Blaze King Mode Roulette. I think this one's actually really creative. It's based on the moment when SEDC lost his arm, and it was impaled on a spike and spun around before melting. So here you actually spin SEDC's arm on a roulette wheel. Then there's Take Me Caesar's Soap Roulette. This is a simple gacha game where the capsules are meant to be Caesar's bubbles. The color of the capsule determines your grade, with the highest being the red capsule based on Caesar's blood bubble. Then there's Hand Over Iggy's Favorite Coffee Gum. Here you pick up a pack of gum and hand it to Iggy, and he determines your grade. Then there's Good Bet Your Souls, where up to two people play against Darby. For this one though, no recording is allowed in the attraction other than your results screen, which is all I could find posted on Twitter. Based on someone's account of the game, first you choose between playing high and low or poker. Then you play the coin dropping game. It seems like you drop real coins into a cup on the table, which is recognized by the game. According to the account, once you get close to overflowing the cup, you're given the option to cheat by pretending to drop a coin or to drop a coin in normally. After winning that, you play one more game where you choose which piece of meat the cat will eat first. I'm assuming that either way you lose this game since Darby cheats by using his own cat. Based on what I've read, whether you win or lose at the games before, you still lose your soul and are saved by Jotaro. But if you did win the previous games, Jotaro praises you. After the attraction, a staff member will give you a prize, saying that a man in a school uniform asked them to give it to you. Like for the Joestar Group World Tour, you get another set of cards, this time for the Egyptian God Stands. Next is the Morio Sightseeing Tour. This is another game in a private booth with no filming allowed. For this one, you play a series of touchscreen minigames and quizzes related to Part 4. The next game is actually a sequel to that Part 5 personality quiz from before. 
In this one, you play games on a computer as either a member of Team Bucciarati or La Squadra. For Bucciarati, you play a hacking game, and for La Squadra, you play a Find the Difference game. For beating the game, you get a card which has a letter to you from one of the team's members. Finally, we have Deliver the Disc, Operation Savage Garden. This is the biggest of all the games, which makes sense with Stone Ocean's adaptation being new at the time. Thankfully, this one actually does have a video. During the announcement stream for the final batch of the anime, Jolene's voice actress Fyro's eye went through it. The game is of course based on the Savage Garden arc from Part 6. You start by playing a touchscreen game where you tap on objects sent at you by Lang Wrangler while avoiding hitting the rats. Then you have to guide Jolene past obstacles in zero gravity. Then the game tells you that Lang Wrangler's ID card is behind the metal drum in the room. You use this to enter a passcode and finish the game. For playing, you get a badge of the Star Platinum Stand Disc. That's all of the JoJo World games. More recently, the event has also made an appearance in America. In March of 2024, it ran in San Jose, California, and in April it's appearing in New Jersey. And it actually does include some of the mini-games. According to the official website, it has the Stone Mask game and the Iggy Coffee Gum game. Most JoJo fans are aware that after Part 3, Jotaro got a job as a marine biologist. However, this isn't actually accurate since the original manga never actually calls him a marine biologist. The official title of Jotaro's job is actually Ocean Explorer. After the end of Part 4, Jotaro got his PhD in oceanography from his thesis on the starfish of Morio. While marine biology is the study of organisms that live in the ocean, oceanography is actually the study of the ocean itself, which encompasses the organisms that live in it. In November of 2023, Araki drew art of the characters Shochan and Risu from the manga Shochan's Adventures to celebrate its 100 year anniversary. The manga debuted in 1923 and was illustrated by Katsuichi Kabashima. He was actually the grandfather of Araki's first editor, Ryosuke Kabashima, who had a very large influence on the first three parts of Jojo. In Araki's note with the illustration, he writes, Going on an adventure with Risu, a squirrel. That's the kind of thrill I dreamed of when I was a kid. This may be the reason why so many of Araki's early manga feature some kind of squirrel-like companion for the main character. His drawing of Shochan also has the letters BT written on his hat, clearly a reference to Araki's first serialized manga, Cool Shock BT. Kabashima actually advocated for BT to be published despite other editors not approving of it, which was very important to starting off Araki's career. Some of you may be familiar with this image of Araki eating a donut. Personally, it's always been one of my favorite pictures of him. However, there's actually somewhat of an urban legend surrounding this photo. The picture used to be repeatedly shared online, often with a much larger than normal file size. The rumor was that the image contained a virus that would infect your computer when opened. Of course, this was just a rumor and often people would pretend to have been affected by it to scare others. The reason its file size would be so large is because it's a very high quality photo scanned directly from the Jojo Minan magazine. Beyond that though, I'm more interested in the history of the image itself. It comes from Araki's 2012 trip to New York as part of his collaboration with Gucci. There he met Gucci's creative director, Frida Giannini, who actually later made an appearance in the Rohan Meets Gucci one-shot. The picture is from a public fair at a local school, Bishop Laughlin Memorial High. The donuts he has are actually from a booth for the New York chain Dough Donuts. And looking at their menu, it appears that he got the hibiscus and lemon poppy donuts, which both look pretty good. In this series, I've gone over the various JoJo escape room attractions that have been held over the years. However, recently there's been one more old one that I was unaware of and never had the chance to talk about. Not only that, it might be my favorite one yet. It's called The Letter Inside Dio's Mansion. It ran from February to May of 2018 exclusively in Japan. It was run by Tokyo Mystery Circus, who have held similar attractions for series like Persona and Yakuza. The reason people seem to be unaware of this one for so long is because the title is quite similar to Invitation to Dio's Mansion, another escape game that was held around the same time as this one. The premise of this game is that the player wakes up in Dio's Mansion where they're locked away by Nukasaku. They find a radio on the ground with the person on the other side being Jotaro. So they have to communicate with Jotaro and the others to escape, while evading attacks in the mansion. The inside of the attraction is completely unknown to us since no photography was allowed. The company also requested that people avoid posting spoilers online. However, by searching through a lot of Japanese Twitter posts, I was eventually able to get some more information on it. The main feature of this attraction is the ability to communicate with the Stardust Crusaders, which is done using the Line app. Presumably, you ask them for hints on how to progress through the puzzles and escape. 
However, what's really interesting here is that they actually have a long list of replies to different words should you send them. These include the names of almost all the characters in the part, as well as stands and some other terms. The full list of these responses was thankfully able to be archived by Japanese fans, since they were able to continue texting them after leaving the attraction. Most responses about characters are basic ones, just saying who they are or where they were encountered. Some of them, though, are actually pretty funny. If you mention Steely Dan, Jotaro says he's the worst person in history. If you bring up Mariah, Joseph says she had impressive legs. In a reference to the final chapter, if you mention the movie Tarzan the Ape Man, Joseph will bring up the actress Bo Derek. And if you mention Eat It, Joseph will respond with Al Yankovic. Some food items also get responses, like the chai they drank in India and the kebab from Pakistan. If you mention cherries, Kakuen will respond by saying it's his favorite food. This is also the only response that comes with a picture, which is of the Kakuen cherry candy that was available for purchase at the event. Some of the responses are surprisingly obscure, like the Joestar family butler Roses, who only appeared in one chapter. Maybe the most obscure thing here is that you can bring up the names of Terence Darby's puppets, which the others remember. If you happen to put in something that isn't on the list, they'll just give a generic response that they don't know what it is. Chronologically, this takes place immediately after the fight with younger Darby, so if you ask about Nukasaku or Vanilla Ice, they have no clue who they are. But they do still say it in a unique way to show that it's still recognized. If you mention Vanilla Ice, Jotaro says that he's not in the mood for anything sweet right now. The same also applies to Oingo and Boingo. Since none of the Crusaders actually knew they existed, they obviously wouldn't have a real response. But they do still uniquely respond, like for example repeating the name back to you. One exception to this though is Sadao Kujo, Jotaro's father. He doesn't actually have a unique response, so Jotaro replies like he doesn't know who he is. Just for all these little details, this has to be one of my favorite Jojo attractions that they've done. The event also had some food for purchase, a kakyu and cherry flavor and Iggy coffee flavor ice cream. Speaking of line, Jojo actually has a few official line stickers. These exist for parts 3 to 6 of Jojo's anime, with some part 1 and 2 stickers being included in the pack that released for the series' anniversary. What's kind of funny is that while they're all in the anime's art style, some seem to actually be traced for the manga itself to include certain poses that couldn't be ripped from the anime, which is kind of an interesting effect. Stickers also released for the Diamond is Unbreakable live-action movie and the Rohan OVAs. Funnily enough, there's also a sticker for Kira's co-worker, likely added since that otherwise extremely minor character is a meme with Japanese fans, which I mentioned in a previous video. Another interesting thing are the Chami line stickers, based on Araki's wife. Yes, she actually does have her own collection of stickers featuring illustrations of herself. Apparently a friend of hers drew them for her so they could use them in their friend group. I wish I had known this earlier so I could have brought it up, since a while ago I did a video about Araki's wife and the various interviews and stories she shared over the years. She's quite an interesting and funny person just like Araki, so I recommend checking out that video since it's one of my favorites that I've done. One of the more mysterious characters in the series is the nameless gangster that inspired Giorno as a child. After he rescued him, the man protected Giorno and inspired him to become a gangster himself. While the character doesn't have a real name, he has been given some titles in an official capacity. In the JoJo trading card game Adventure Battle Card, he's actually referred to as Gangstar, which I think is actually a really fitting name to give him. He also appears as a unit in the mobile gacha game Stardust Shooters. There he's referred to as Man X. Unlocking him in the game is actually pretty difficult, since he's rewarded for logging in after 2,000 days. That's almost five and a half years. This would also be impossible to obtain for many players. The game first released in March of 2014 and closed permanently in April of 2021. That's seven years, meaning you'd have to have started playing very early to even have a chance of obtaining this character. The name Man X was later used in the credits for Part 5's anime adaptation. In the credits for the English dub, his name was changed slightly from Man X to Mr. X. In my previous video, I brought up Shonen Thunder issue number 4, the earliest known drawing made by Araki when he was in elementary school. There I mentioned that he signed his drawing with the pen name Toshiyuki Araki. However, I'd like to issue a correction here since this is actually not a pen name. Hirohiko Araki is a pen name, and Toshiyuki Araki is actually his real name. I was a bit thrown off since Araki once wrote under a different pen name for his original one-shot, The Bottle. 
where he went by Toshi Arakino. You can see how that pen name also included part of his real first name. He wouldn't actually use the name Hirohiko Araki until Cool Shock BT a little bit later. If we're issuing corrections here, I actually have yet another one from the previous video. I'd like to personally apologize to Penguin-san the Penguin from the Stone Ocean anime event SOS from Green Dolphin Street Jail. This was a crossover event with the Sea Paradise Aquarium, which also featured an animal show. The plot for it was that White Snake stole the memory disc from the Penguin, making it unable to pull on the sign to start the dolphin show. There I pointed out that in all the recordings I found, after the Penguin was healed, it just ate the fish right off the string without triggering the sign, and the handler had to do it for him. However, I was mistaken, and I actually have found a video where the Penguin successfully pulls the sign, so I would like to apologize to the Penguin. Although in more recent footage from their Christmas event, it appears that Penguin-san has gone completely rogue and is having trouble with the sign again. One JoJo stand that you may not be familiar with is this one, Remote Romance. It doesn't actually appear in the series itself, but rather was created by Araki for the 2012 JoJo exhibition for the series' 25th anniversary. This was an event held displaying multiple pieces of JoJo art as well as some sculptures of characters and objects from the series. The stand came about due to tickets for the exhibition selling out early, so the stand became a way to view the gallery from home. Using the Hangouts feature of Google+, viewers were able to see from the stand's perspective as it walked through the gallery. There were also separate feeds showing the stand from another perspective. The faces of the people in the call would actually end up displayed on the screen on the stand's face. The stand's name is based on the song Remote Romance by the band Camel. The album the song originates from, I Can See Your House From Here, was also titled Remote Romance in its Japanese release. The stand itself also has a bit of backstory included. It's said that the original user was a legendary hacker named Dixie Flatline, who was sentenced to death leaving his stand behind on the internet. The name Dixie Flatline is taken from the 1984 science fiction novel Neuromancer, from a character who similarly died while leaving his mind behind on a ROM. One interesting JoJo crossover I want to mention is Learn English with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. This is a series of guidebooks made to teach the reader English with translations of moments from JoJo. The first book released in October of 2014, using quotes from parts 1 to 4. This continued in 2016 with a book for parts 5 through 7. And finally, the newest book that released in November of 2023, focusing on part 8, while including quotes from the rest of the series as well. Maybe the most interesting thing about this series, though, is that it is supervised by Marty Friedman, lead guitarist of the band Megadeth. It seems that he's quite a big fan of JoJo to still be collaborating after almost 10 years of these books. For the release of the first book, Friedman himself appeared in a promotional video advertising it, where he reads quotes from JoJo. That's why. I'll be the judge of that. I'll beat you till you cry. That's right. Everything this JoJo does is carefully thought out in advance. Don't answer a question with another question. Hey everybody, this is Marty Friedman. Minasan, ego wa muzukashii to motemasen ka? No problem. Friedman has actually done a lot of work in Japan and has contributed music to many different Japanese games and movies. It's kind of surreal seeing certain iconic lines translated in ways we aren't really used to as English speakers. However, some of them come out a little clunky, which sort of goes against the whole purpose. Another obscure JoJo crossover is the times that Araki actually made art for films. In a 2003 issue of Weekly Shonen Jump, Araki drew this picture of Jolene and Neo as an advertisement for The Matrix Reloaded. In 2007, he made a series of images for the Japanese premiere of the Christopher Nolan film The Prestige. The actors he drew here include Christian Bale, Scarlett Johansson, and Hugh Jackman. The illustrations were given out as stickers with the purchase of tickets for the film. In 2011, Araki wrote a review for the movie Taken for the Asahi Shinbun newspaper, which was accompanied by an illustration of Liam Neeson's character and his daughter. The JoJo series is pretty notable for having quite a lot of spin-off content, particularly in the form of novels. We have eight original novels based on various parts, two novelizations of the live-action films, and a whole lot of short stories. People watching would probably be familiar with the main novels like Purple Haze Feedback, Over Heaven, or the somewhat infamous George Joestar. However, one you're very unlikely to know is one that never actually got released. I'm talking about The Anatomy Lessons of Dr. Nicholas Tolt. This was a novel written by the author Otsuichi in 2000. It's a sequel to Part 4 focused on a boy named Kaoru who ends up meeting Josuke. Otsuichi had written a 400-page manuscript for the novel, but wasn't really happy with how it turned out. 
In 2002, a 30-page excerpt of the book was released in the magazine Yomu Jump. This is the only known piece of the novel that's available. This came with a release date for the novel in February of 2003. However, this didn't really work out. Otsuichi later said he had written over 2,000 pages that had been thrown out. He later started from scratch and completely reworked the story, finally completing the novel in 2007. The finished product was the book, Fourth Another Day. This novel was also a sequel to Part 4, however it had nothing to do with the initial story. This version is much more well known, understandably since it's an actual completed book which even has a fan translation, but it just makes this old draft version really interesting. This actually got multiple illustrations by Araki showing Josuke in his Part 6 style, all of which is unused after this point. It also includes a new stand, the ability of the main character Kaoru. The stand doesn't have a name, but its ability is to spawn objects underneath his skin. However, he needs to cut his skin to access the items. We don't see the full form of his stand, but in the illustration you can see the shape of a horned being behind him, which probably would have been revealed in the full story. Unlike the final novel, this version doesn't actually have a fan translation yet, but I'd be very interested in reading it. So if it were to get one, I'd definitely make a video about it sometime in the future. If you were online around 2014, you may be familiar with the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, a fundraising campaign for ALS disease research. It involved pouring a bucket of cold water over your head while donating money to a charity and tagging others to do it as well. In August of 2014, Araki actually participated in this. A video was uploaded to a channel with his name, showing him walking out into the woods before having water poured over him. In the description, he nominated Sako Toshio, creator of the manga Usugui, who he actually collaborated with before. The singer Sayuri Ishikawa, who Araki had drawn an album cover for a couple years prior, Toshiyuki Takano of the Shinjuku Takano Company, which is a luxury fruit seller similar to the Higashikata family that appeared in Jojolian, and Mitsumasa Mita, director of the Meijiza Kabuki Theater in Tokyo. Since then, the channel has not uploaded any more videos. In a previous Fun Facts video, I mentioned Breeze Girl, a song from the band Baseball Bear which used an image of Yukiko from Part 4 as its cover and the depiction of her for its music video. This cover actually has one more interesting appearance, since it can actually be seen in the final chapter of the manga Gantz. Due to it being displayed on an actual billboard at the time, it appears along with other advertisements in Tokyo in the background. Finally, we have a bit of behind-the-scenes info from the Stone Ocean anime. In the commentary for the third Blu-ray set, we get a conversation between Toshiyuki Kato, director of the Stone Ocean adaptation, Yasuko Kobayashi, the anime screenwriter, and Kanichi Suzuki, the animation director. They mention the reference to Rohan near the end of Part 6, where a mangaka is unable to finish his manuscript due to accelerated time. He asks if anyone is able to submit their work on time and hears that Rohan is, a joke referencing Rohan's extremely fast drawing abilities. They say that they actually considered showing Rohan himself in the anime. They eventually decided against it, since if they weren't going to do anything significant with him, then they shouldn't bring him back, and that the line mentioning him is enough. And that's every fun fact for now. I've said it before, but these fun facts videos are some of my favorites to make. While they started off as just a way to include a series of smaller topics that aren't enough for their own videos, it's actually branched out a bit and some of these topics are pretty big. So much so that I may actually be taking another look at them soon, since some of these definitely deserve a standalone video, like the Stone Ocean Aquarium or all the escape room attractions. If there's a topic you'd like to see me go over, whether it's in the Fun Facts series or standalone video, comment it down below. If you want to keep up with future videos, make sure to subscribe and click the bell. You can also join the Hum and Beat Discord to be notified about new videos and any important JoJo news. Finally, I'd appreciate if you help support the channel on Patreon. There you receive Discord perks and you can submit patron questions. This video's question comes from Rex. They ask what my thoughts are on the covers for the English JoJo volumes. Well, my opinion is mixed, but maybe not in the way you expect. For starters, I actually like the new Jojoni and Meraki illustrations. It's definitely an interesting choice to have these since they don't match the contents of the book. But despite what a lot of people say when Araki draws old characters, I think they're actually good looking. Starting with Part 4, the books now use the original volume cover since there's no more Jojonium illustrations. Again, I like these. The idea of having two covers, each on the front and back, is pretty smart since these are omnibus releases, and it ensures that we don't lose out on having a cover just from bad timing. Of course, I have my issues with the release, mostly down to the localization issues and some of the formatting inside, but as part of my collection, I enjoy them. 
If you want to submit a question, you can join the Patreon at any tier and send them over DMs or in the community chat. Previously, this was only available on the mobile app, but now it's finally usable on desktop. If you just go to the side tab that says Community, you can leave your questions there. There's no limit to how many questions you can ask, so feel free to send in as many as you want, and they don't have to be related to JoJo either. Thank you for watching. This is the part of the video where I thank my $5 and up patrons. Thank you to Sloth Dog, Doorbell, Crayon, Rigovids, Zucato, Pumpkin Doge, Marrow, Almighty Quarth, Gatlin Grove, Lime Jinjo, Sponge Cake, Kakext, Feliciano Rabaja, Rayana Meme, Christian McDonough, Emmanuel Etienne, Pulse Dog, Great Riek, Carmotrina, Zach Greenfield, FIFO, Rob Goliath, Jacob Smith, Big T, C Manga, Minty, Gold, Jolene, and Monticelli.